Hi, I'm Norman Wildberger. Today we're going to carry on talking about contributions that the ancient Greeks made to the foundations of hyperbolic geometry as we are going to present the subject in this course. So the main figure today is Pappus who lived in Alexandria around 300 years after the birth of Christ. Alexandria, the city in Egypt, was the center of mathematical learning for oh, at least 500 years in the ancient world. And it's certainly the most important city in the history of mathematics. Pappus wrote a volume called Collection, which consists of eight books, of which seven survive. And we're going to start by talking about his most famous theorem, which is certainly one of the most famous theorems and most important theorems in all of mathematics. It's a theorem that only involves a straight edge. So there's no notions of perpendicularity or no measurements needed to understand this theorem. It's a very elementary uh, theorem in mathematics. What does it say? It says that if A1, A2, and A3 are collinear points, so it means they all lie on a line, and if B1, B2, and B3 are collinear points, then these three points that we can create from them are also collinear. What are these three points? Well, C1 is A2, B3 times A3, B2. So we're using our convention for lines and points. That if we have two points, then their product is the line joining them. So A2, B3 would be that line there, and A3, B2 would be that line there, and the product of those two lines is where they meet. That's the point C1. C2 is A1, B3 times A3, B1, so it's the meet of these two lines. And C3 is A1, B2 times A2, B1, so it's the meet of this line and this line. And these three points are collinear. That's the statement of Pappus's theorem. Very elegant, lovely fact. Today's first exercise is to verify Pappus's theorem for yourself in some special cases. And make sure that you convince yourself that it doesn't matter where on the first line A1, A2, and A3 are, and where on the second line B1, B2, and B3 are. And also give some thought to what happens in the special case of A2, B3, and A3, B2, for example, are parallel. If they're parallel, then officially they don't actually meet, or if they meet, they meet at infinity. Does the theorem still have some content in that case? Ultimately, we're going to see that this is really a theorem of projective geometry, and in projective geometry, we're going to add some points at infinity to make all these statements completely true. Okay, now we're going to go to another important contribution of Pappus, the idea of a cross-ratio, which he at least implicitly introduced. Although I think there may be some evidence that perhaps Euclid was aware of this concept as well. So the cross ratio is a concept that extends our notion of harmonic range that we were talking about in our last video. Let me remind you that if we have four points on a line, these four points, and let me write them now as A, C, B, and D, then we say that this is a harmonic range if these two points are harmonic conjugates with respect to these two, and conversely, these two are harmonic conjugates with respect to these two. And what does that mean? It means that the ratio of the vector AC to the vector AD is minus the ratio of the vector BC to BD. I'm changing the role of the points here a little bit. Last time I talked about four points A, B, C, D. I'm going to switch the role of A, of B and C here because this particular form is the more standard way of writing it and will lead to our standard way of writing the cross ratio. Okay, so we can reinterpret this equality here by saying, well, what we really have is a ratio of ratios, that this ratio divided by this ratio is minus 1. 
And we're going to say that this really is the same as that the cross ratio of AB to CD is minus 1. I should make a little note here that I'm using a slightly different notation here for harmonic range than I did in my Wild Trig series, the video number 39, where I talk about harmonic ranges there. So basically, I'm interchanging the role of B and C from that one, a small difference that works a little bit better with what we're trying to do the here. Okay, so this is the this is the motivation for this cross ratio. This is going to be a cross ratio. What exactly is this? So suppose we have any four collinear points, A, B, C, D, and they can be in any order that you like on a line. Then we'll say that the cross ratio R of A comma B colon C comma D is the ratio of AC to AD to BC to BD. So it's a ratio of ratios. There's one ratio between two vectors. There's another ratio between two vectors. We're taking the ratio of those two ratios. And A, B, C, D are the four points, but we're kind of grouping them into two pairs here. The A and B are playing a certain role. The C and D are playing a certain role. And the uh, colon there separates those two groups. Now, in terms of coordinates, suppose that we have some coordinates on this affine line. We've made a ruler, made some coordinates. And let's say for simplicity that the coordinates of these points are actually little a, little b, little c, and little d themselves. So we'll momentarily identify the points with their coordinates. Well, then the vector AC divided by the vector AD is the same as A minus C divided by A minus D. And this ratio BC to BD is the same as B minus C divided by B minus D. So we can also think of this as being a definition of the cross ratio in terms of the coordinates of the four points. And you can see that I think that A and B are sort of playing a symmetrical role. The A here is reflected in the B here. And you can see that C and D are sort of playing symmetrical roles. There's two C's there and there's D's there. But this is only one of a number of different cross ratios that these four points define. If we chose the points in a different order, we could, in fact, create 24 different cross ratios because there are 24 different ways of arranging the four points in an arbitrary order. But it turns out, as we'll see, that only six of these possible 24 cross ratios are actually generally different. So even if you try all possible combinations, we're going to see that in fact you only get, in general, six different possible numbers emerging. So this cross ratio is crucially important concept. It's really the fundamental concept in projective geometry in terms of measurements. It's a fundamental concept in algebraic geometry and we'll see that it's really a fundamental concept in hyperbolic geometry too. So we really want to have some experience with this cross ratio and I urge you to try it out, make some points, calculate some cross ratios. Here we're going to look at this following example. Suppose A happens to be the point 1, B is minus 2, C is 3, and D is 5. So let's compute the cross ratio R, A, B, C, D. Here's the definition. It's A minus C divided by A minus D over B minus C divided by B minus D. So A minus C, 1 minus 3, A minus D, 1 minus 5, B minus C is minus 2 minus 3, and B minus D is minus 2 minus 5. So this becomes minus 2 over minus 4. This becomes minus 5 over minus 7. This is one fraction divided by another fraction, so when you evaluate it, you have to invert that second fraction, and we get 7 tenths. Here's a different cross ratio for the same points, but now in the order B, D, C, A. 
So now the formula is going to be B minus C divided by B minus A over D minus C divided by D minus A. Okay, that becomes minus 2 minus 3, B minus A minus 2 minus 1, D minus C, 5 minus 3, and D minus A, 5 minus 1, which is minus 5 over minus 3, all over 2 over 4, and when you evaluate it, that's 10 over 3. And finally, you could check that the cross ratio DA, BC is minus 7 thirds. So there's some explicit examples and I encourage you to work out some yourself so you get familiar with this cross ratio. Our next theorem tells us exactly what happens to a cross ratio when we perform some simple permutations of the four points. We'll call it the cross ratio transformation theorem because it tells us how the cross ratio transforms. So suppose we have four points A, B, C, D and the cross ratio A, B, C, D is some number lambda. Then, if you interchange the A and the B, you get 1 over lambda. And that's the same as what you get when you interchange the C and the D. And secondly, if you interchange the B and the C, you get 1 minus lambda. And that's the same thing that you get when you interchange the A and the D. So those two basic transformations. Lambda goes to 1 over lambda or lambda goes to 1 minus lambda. Either interchanging this one and this one, that's 1 over lambda, or you're interchanging this pair or this pair, that gives you 1 minus lambda. And the proof I'm going to leave to you as an exercise. It's a straightforward exercise using a bit of algebraic manipulation and the definition of the cross ratio. You can see this first one, that's very easy to see. If you interchange A and B, then this term and this term interchange, and so you're just getting the reciprocal of lambda. That's sort of obvious. So please check the other ones as well. You may have to do a little bit of calculation to check that one. And now as a consequence of that, as a corollary, I can say that any permutation of the four points gives a value for the cross ratio which is one of these six. We started off with lambda. We get one over lambda. We also get one minus lambda from our transformation theorem. Now if you could take one over this, you get one over one minus lambda. And if you take one minus this thing, you get, well, 1 minus that will be lambda over 1 minus lambda. That's this one. And if you take 1 over that one, you get this one. And any further 1 overs or 1 minuses do not take you outside of this set. You can have a look to see that that's true. So if you start with lambda, then all the cross ratios that you can obtain from those four points are these six, in general, six values here. What makes the cross ratio so important is this theorem here, the cross ratio theorem, which states that the cross ratio is invariant under a projection. What does it mean? It means that if we have some four points on a line, A, B, C, D, in any order, and we project those four points onto another line, obtaining for new points, A prime, B prime, C prime, and D prime, then the cross ratio here and the cross ratio here are the same. So the cross ratio of A, B, C, D is equal to the cross ratio of A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. This shows that the cross ratio is really a projective notion. It looks like it's an affine notion because we originally defined it in terms of coordinates on a line, but it turns out that it has a purely projective nature. Another interesting consequence of this is that the notion of a cross ratio for four points that are collinear can now be transferred to the notion of four lines which are concurrent. 
So if we have four points A, B, C, D on some line, and we have some point off the line, and lines say K, L, M, and N, joining this other point to R4, then we can define the cross ratio of the four lines to be the cross ratio of the four points. This theorem is telling us that that's a decent definition, that it's, it's a proper definition in the sense that if we change these four points to some other four points meeting these lines, the cross ratio doesn't change. So it makes sense to define the cross ratio of these lines in this way. So four collinear points or four concurrent lines, they both have a cross ratio. And you can go from one to the other. The cross ratio of these four lines is equal to the cross ratio of those four points. The cross ratio of these four points is equal to the cross ratio of those four lines. The cross ratio theorem is not due to Pappas. It's due to Desargues. We're going to talk a lot about him. He's a very important figure for our story because he's really the father of projective geometry, which we're slowly getting to. There's another important figure, Michel Chasselet, another Frenchman who contributed to the subject, and this is a very beautiful theorem of his. It's related to a cross ratio of four points on a circle. Actually, it turns out that circle can be replaced by any conic, but let's just state it for a circle now. So here's his theorem, that if alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are fixed points on a circle, so here they are right here, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Notice that I'm using Greek letters because the points are actually on the circle. And K, L, M, N are the joins to a fifth point eta on the circle. So we have some fifth point eta, just going to play a different role, and we have the four lines joining eta to alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and those lines are called K, L, M, and N. Then the cross ratio of K, L, M, and N, of these four lines, is independent of eta. So it means you move this eta along the circle, these four lines all move, they're still all connected to these four points, they're moving, their cross ratio is staying the same. Now a bit of a warning, in some texts this theorem is proved using uh, some arguments involving angles. I just warn you that those proofs are often a little bit flawed. In fact, generally proofs involving angles are not logically very tight. We're going to talk about this and other theorems, but ultimately we're going to present very tight proofs of everything. And it's going to be a logically tight course. Right now I'm just getting you familiar with some of the basic concepts. Later on we're going to tighten things up and you're going to know exactly what everything is and exactly what the proofs are. So I remark again that for a circle, in fact, it's not too hard to see why this is true. Uh, because it's closely related to the fact that, that uh, a chord uh, subtends the same angle or spread for any point on the circle. But the theorem actually works for a general conic, for ellipses and hyperbolas too, for which it's much less uh, obvious. This cross ratio, as I said before, is the most important invariant in projective geometry. Projective geometry is the geometry of a straight edge, and it has its origins with the work of Pappus, as we've seen. And then the father of the subject is Gerard Desargues, who lived in the 1600s. He's really the founder of the subject. There were a few people at that time who appreciated Desargues' understandings, including Pascal and Lahir, but generally his contemporaries didn't understand what he was talking about, and his fabulous work was ignored for almost 200 years, when it was reborn in the 1800s. And then there was a flowering of projective geometry, sort of the second period, involving many uh, important figures. So this is going to be a very important aspect of our story. Ultimately, we're going to frame hyperbolic geometry in the, w in the framework of projective geometry.
So to get you a little bit up to speed with projective geometry, here are some videos that I've already made that you can have a look at. So in my Wild Trig series, the ones from 31 to 41 provide something of an introduction to projective geometry. These are all relatively short videos, only 10 minutes long. And then the Math History number 8 is a history of projective geometry. So please have a look at those videos. We are going to treat projective geometry, but it's good to have already some experience of it. So I know that some of you will be impatient to be getting on to hyperbolic geometry itself. And next time we are going to start with hyperbolic geometry, just using the tools that we've sketched up till now. So I'm basically going to explain to you what are the basic notions in universal hyperbolic geometry next time. And a lot of really important formulas, I'm going to be in a position to write them down for you. So you have a look at them, play with them, and think about them. So the next video is a very important one. We're going to start hyperbolic geometry. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Walberger. Thanks for listening.